So, thank you very much. I can't believe that in 45 minutes we covered all this territory. <laughs> with a great deal of detail and thought, so thank you all very, very much. I, um, I want to open the floor to questions. Um, and uh, sorry, you know, could you, uh, what is the sorry, position? We're, sorry, we are um, oh. taping this to use on our website, so if you would identify yourself, please ask a question and make it short. Yeah, yes, my name is Bernie Weisenfeld. I'm a, 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 an alumnus of Columbia. And my question is, what, uh, what is the position of Aung San Suu Kyi against, uh, as far as violence against the Rohingya? Yeah, um, so Aung San Suu Kyi has not taken a strong negative or even a mildly negative position against the violence. Um, I think one of the most negative statements I have heard her say was after the UN report, she said in retro something, I'm paraphrasing, but in retrospect, we could have handled some things better, but we do the best that we can and uh, we're the ones who really know the situation on the ground. Um, so she has not taken a negative stance really in any way. Um, there's a lot of speculation on possible reasons for that. I've heard people say, well, you know, the military really still retains power, so she doesn't have a lot of room necessarily there. Um, the UN report uh, said, wow, the civilian government hasn't had control of the military's actions with regards to the Rohingya. It has certainly contributed to them by cover-ups, uh, by refusal to address them in any way. Um, there's little political incentive for her within Myanmar to address the issue as uh, the Rohingya are unpopular among many people in Myanmar. Um, there's deep-seated prejudice. Uh, there has been, uh, as Phil mentioned, there's been little international pressure to really take a stance. Um, and who knows what her personal feelings are. Uh, it's very possible that she harbors prejudice against the Rohingya. Yeah, I would add just a few things. Um, I would go actually a little bit further than, than that. I would say that, in fact, she was involved, at least in the early period during in September 2017, by some of her statements, particularly the statement she made to the big gathering of diplomats in September 2017 when, you know, she decided not to go to the uh, UN General Assembly. Uh, she made a statement and said, and she said that, uh, you know, the operations against uh, these clearance operations had stopped uh, as of September 5th. <coughs> When in fact we have uh, documented evidence, including satellite photos and others, that show that in fact it did continue uh, throughout September into October. You know, so you know either she was misinformed or she was covering it up. Um, she's the foreign minister too. She's also the foreign minister. People forget that. So she's the one who made the decision not to issue the visas of the fact-finding mission of the UN. She's also the person who's made the decision to not allow the Special Rapporteur for Human Rights in Myanmar, Yang Hee Lee, back into the country. Uh, she's also the person who's the party leader of the party that has an overwhelming majority in the parliament. So, you know, she could change almost any sort of law or regulation she wants uh, in terms of uh, how Rakhine State is dealt with, <coughs> in terms of, you know, dealing with the General Administration Department and the, and the role of the military down to the township level. She could do all these different things. She simply has not done it. Um, during the election in 2015, of course, there was an effort by the military working with some of the Buddhist ultranationalists to try to label her as a lover of Muslims. They saw this as a way to try to dent her popularity. It didn't really work. Uh, even the Minister of Information's wife was involved in circulating uh, a photo of Hong San Suu Kyi that had been doctored to include her wearing the hijab. Um, so, you know, there's a game being played behind the scenes by the military to try to identify her as being pro-Muslim as a way to try to diminish her popularity. But I would say that, you know, she has become essentially the, you could say either the sort of shield or the court ornament of, of a policy of, of crimes against humanity and ethnic cleansing. And, and possibly, according to the FFM, uh, you know, genocide. And so she, she's got a lot to answer for. People said at the very beginning, they said, look, 
you know, the FFM is not after you. They're after the military. So you should let them in, say, you know, okay, I, we respect the UN, we respect the mandate, the Human Rights Council, let them in, let them go there, they can go talk to the military. You can say, look, I can't get you into Northern Rakhine State, that's a security area under the Constitution, I don't have the ability to do that. And everybody would have understood. Everybody was, in fact, looking for that kind of excuse to say, you know, it's not her, it's the military. And she didn't play along. She had the easiest political play in the world. So she's either dense or she's culpable. Um, and, oh, I, 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 another question here. Uh, I'm David Timberman, also a Columbia grad. Um, nobody mentioned, uh, I mean, for understandable time limits, um, National Human Rights Commissions or the role of judiciaries. So I'm just curious, you know, just in your for the region, you know, are there any any evidence that human rights commissions are of any had any effect at this? And also, what about the judiciary? I mean, in the case of the Philippines, Carlos, right? I mean, there's already there has been one case that's gone against the police, right? And there's a Supreme Court case still waiting to, I guess, to be uh, decided. So, can you tell us in on those? Yeah, sure. Uh, just to start on the Philippines. Uh, we do have the Philippine National Human Rights Commission. Uh, the problem with that is uh, they face a lot of problems, actually. <laughs> One is that they're a very, very ineffective uh, uh, commission. And it's only recently, in fact, when Delima, the senator, who is now in jail, when she was the one who's running that, that it sort of was in reinvigorated. It doesn't have a lot of resources, doesn't have a lot of funds, and the president hates it. And, their, and the man that, that the, the person that runs it, and so uh, from it is s severely incapable of 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 undergo uh, of conducting its own investigation. It has limited number of people. It's only it only covers the regions, and not a lot of people cover the provinces. So they're trying now to. Uh, <coughs> To, to try to make up for lost time by uh, uh, getting a lot of money from the Europeans uh, to try to uh, uh, improve their capacity in terms of investigation. Uh, but uh, the jury is still out on that one, whether that work. at least they're doing something. So there's a problem with uh, the, the Commission on Human Rights. Um, and then we have the judiciary. You may recall that last year, uh, the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court was uh, removed from office. Uh, on threat of impeachment, she resigned uh, because she was accused of not filing her statement of assets and liabilities, which is uh, an allegation that uh, they, 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 they uh, apparently she didn't sufficiently answer. And so the Supreme Court, all the other members of the Supreme Court voted, uh, no, she did not resign, voted against her, basically ousting her. Uh, from from the bench, uh, and, but she was also a very very critical of the drug war and Duterte. So, and the whole judiciary in the Philippines right now is um, the problem with the judiciary. It's always been uh, a dysfunctional judiciary. In fact, Duterte himself, in justifying the drug war, said oftentimes that the reason why I'm killing all of these drug suspects is because the courts are not able to <coughs> process them. Uh, which is to, to, uh, uh, which is kind of sick, if you ask me, as sick rationale for that. But it has a ring of truth to it, because the, the judiciary in the Philippines, the courts. I mean, we're talking about the whole system. It's just so dysfunctional. Cases take decades to resolve, and it's so overwhelmed <laughs> with number of uh, the dockets are so overwhelmed. The court dockets are so overwhelmed that it's barely functioning. But right now things are improving. They say, uh, but I think. The problem is so huge that I don't think they are in a position to really uh, 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 deal with all of this. So yeah, I don't know. In Want to talk about Indonesia? Well, we have three national commission on human rights in Jakarta. One is for human rights in general. Another one for women's rights, and the other one is for uh, child protection. Uh, in general, many human rights 
analysts, observers agree that the child protection one is the worst. They urge the court to ban homosexuality. They consider that homosexuality is an intervention from the West, that a gay men are the prime suspect of abuses against children. So in the name of child protections, they ask homosexuality to be criminalized. The National uh, Commission on Human Rights in general is also having understaffed, understaffing problem like the Philippines. Uh, some of their members are quite political. They are promoted by either the military or the Indonesian Ulama Council. And some of them also urge individually the parliament to criminalize uh, gay sex, uh, LGBT individual. The best, of course, is the Women's Rights uh, Commission. Uh, kudos to women again. Uh, so far, it is the best performing human rights commission in Indonesia. Meanwhile, the court, just like in the Philippines and many other countries in Southeast Asia, are dysfunctional. Decades of cases, uh, Indonesian prisons are overcrowded because of uh, drugs inmates. So without any, any effort to overhaul the legal system in Indonesia, we will have worse and worse problems. Uh, my last point is that the fact that Prabowo Subianto is running for president, someone indicted by the UN, involved in accused of human rights, serious human rights abuses over the last 30 years, uh, showing the shortcoming of Indonesian legal system. Yes, he should be, he should be in prison rather than running for, for... I would just add a couple things. I, uh, in terms of Malaysia, the Human Rights Commission, Suhakam, has had a remarkable rebound. Uh, when we first started working with it in the early 2000 period, uh, most people felt that it was uh, a government lapdog. It wasn't terribly effective. Uh, we now have seen, you know, the, the second set of good, good commissioners. Um, you know, I mean, the the way to tell whether a human rights commission is really functioning is to what extent people take cases to it. Um, and you know, in Malaysia, you see more and more people involving Suhakam, taking Suhakam seriously, taking cases there, and then Suhakam investigating. Um, and that's, that's really quite important. Um, you know, the other thing that will happen in, in, in Malaysia, which is, uh, is, is now slated to happen probably this, this coming March, is the creation of the uh, IPCMC, uh, which is the, uh, the police commission to look over abuses by police. Because there's been an ongoing problem that, you know, somewhere between 30 and 50 people die <coughs> in police custody every year in Malaysia. And, you know, these people are basically being beaten to death. And it's like sort of, oops, you hit him too hard, sorry. You know, but then a cover-up uh, follows. Um, so that's going to be an important part of it. Uh, in Thailand, the initial Thailand National Human Rights Commission, the first set of commissioners were, were fantastic. Uh, they were going everywhere. They did some incredible investigations. Uh, you know, I remember looking at their report about land grabbing after the, in, uh, the Indian Ocean tsunami you know, where they basically had documented all these incredibly rich, wealthy Thais coming in and basically taking over the lands that had been cleared by the tsunami uh, and, and calling it all out. Uh, but that was obviously too much for the civil service and for the military and the police. And so what they did is they then revised the act and they have gutted it since through appointments of basically lapdog commissioners. Uh, and that's where we are right now. We have one or two good commissioners and the rest are useless. And nobody is taking any complaints to the National Human Rights Commission of Thailand anymore because why waste your time? You know, so it basically ends up as a situation where, well, you know, you can talk about human rights promotion activities. So they'll do their Human Rights National Day thing and, and they'll, they'll roll out a curriculum for the sixth graders or something like that. But, you know, I mean, it, it, when, it, when you talk about real activity to deal with the uh, you know, violations taking place, it's not happening. And, and, and then the other countries of ASEAN, they don't have human rights commissions.
So, you know, I mean, you know, Cambodia says they have a human rights commission, but it's under the prime minister's office, you know, and basically they trot him out to deal with a special rapporteur. Uh, you know, so these are the these are the games that are being played, and the, there's an ASEAN government intergovernmental commission on human rights, uh, which once again shows that um, ASEAN is not equal to the sum of its parts. And uh, you know, this is a commission where you cannot file a complaint. You ask yourself, what does the commission does? It receives complaints. Well, the ASEAN intergovernmental commission on human rights doesn't doesn't file complaints, doesn't receive complaints. It's barred from doing so. So again. And the judiciary, I mean, I don't even know where to start. Um, you know, I would say that it's very interesting. Cambodia, there's just a thing called the uh, World Justice Project. There was a report that came out, uh, I think it was two or three days ago, where they do an evaluations of the countries around the world, uh, you know, and looking at uh, access to justice, the judiciary, how it functions, and events like that. And uh, Cambodia came in second to last. The only one that they found that was worse in Cambodia is Venezuela. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, and I haven't looked at that. I've got to go actually go back through it and look at all the other findings. But I expect we'll see a significant number of the ASEAN countries at the tail end of uh, that report. And just to add briefly, um, in Myanmar, the government has formed, I think, a few commissions now to allegedly look into the abuses in Rakhine State. But any international participants have quit rather than be a part of what they said was whitewashing. And I think there's no perception that they were anything other than whitewashing. There is also, I forgot, that there is also a Human Rights Commission in Myanmar, mm -hmm. which is not, con it is not believed to be independent and uh, basically the, it's so bad that the Office of High Commissioner for Human Rights stopped working with it. Okay. So another question here. Uh, uh, Jonathan Holland from American Jewish Health Service. Uh, Phil, you spoke about the receding power of uh, presence and influence of the U.S. in Southeast Asia, but at the same time, we've seen the, the rise of China's influence and presence uh, in a lot of these countries. I'm just curious if folks could speak to the impact that that has had on the human rights situation across the region. Okay. Um, well, it's made it much more dang dangerous for Uyghurs, wherever Uyghurs go with it. <laughs> uh, I mean, I think that. I put it that. You know, I think that, you know, in, in some ways it gives some sort of, uh, so, you know, it gives the idea that these authoritarian governments have somebody in their corner, which is important for their sort of morale. They don't feel like they're being completely marginalized in the international community. Uh, countries like uh, Burma, you know, are, are reasonably confident that, you know, there won't be a referral to the ICC by the UN Security Council because China's there. You know, there's a there's somebody who's going to defend them. Um, they're still sensitive about being accused on human rights violations, uh, but they 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 seem to be in some cases perhaps less less worried about losing, for instance, foreign aid. I mean, foreign aid is I mean the big the big the big mechanisms now that work in terms of human rights issues are trade and trade mechanisms. So everything but arms dealing with Cambodia and, and possibly Burma in the future, uh, the European Vietnam free trade agreement and, you know, the effort to, you know, force Vietnam to, to take up the labor protections there. Trade is the now the big push. Uh, you know, you talk about, you know, we're not going to give you, you know, a, a $5 million project uh, for this because you've done something bad on human rights. The government's like, so what? Anybody else? Rising China. Uh, yeah. Human Rights Watch is trying to approach Jakarta to have more say on the Rohingyas in Myanmar and also on the Uyghur uh, in China, of course. We have been doing it over the last two or three years. Mm -hmm. uh, achieved some minor success on Rohingya issue, Indonesia could access to Rakhine State, mostly humanitarian work, hospital, doctors sending food, uh, planes of food, Hercules, a Hercules sent to do some food, but more than that, almost nothing. The Uyghur is more complicated. Of course, China is Indonesia's largest 
economic business foreign investor in Indonesia. Uh, South China Sea problem is also complicating things. Uh, at the same time, local politics in Indonesia is quite hostile against ethnic Chinese minorities inside Indonesia. So things are more difficult uh, regarding how to deal with Beijing in Indonesia. Just to add, I think in the Philippines, I agree with what Phil said about uh, some governments or the Philippine government feeling that they have somebody in the corner with them. But I think it's uh, there's something more than that. I mean, in the, in the case of the Philippines, um, you know, certainly Chinese presence in trade and investments uh, or economic uh, uh, life has gone uh, really you know, uh, uh, more significant. You know, you have investments, for instance, with Chinese companies, and I suppose uh, you know, uh, made made. Uh, 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 realized by, by, by with the help of the Chinese government, he, uh, there's this project in, in, in the Philippines where uh, telecommunications companies, Huawei, uh, would put up a, a surveillance infrastructure for the police, things like that. And you have lots of investment in mining and extractive industries uh, by Chinese companies, and you have also real estate and. Uh, other uh, uh, industries that are being increasingly being given to Chinese uh, companies. And so, you know, uh, there's a lot of, the Philippine government, this administration particularly, they feel that, that those are you know, stamps of approval, that they're going to be protected no matter what, and that all of these allegations about human rights abuse in the Philippines, China will just simply will look away. Uh, at the very least, so yeah, a lot of uh, a lot of enabling that's happening. In the Philippines. I see a hand in the back and then in front. So we'll take the back first. State your name and. Uh, my name is Sam, I'm a member of the uh, New York Southeast Asian um, group, and I guess I have a question for the Indonesia researcher, and that was uh, I'm curious about the current situation in regards to Papua and Papuans and. You know, there's still, I know that, you know, when Jokowi originally came in, you know, he was very popular in, at least relative to other presidential candidates in Papua, and kind of, and I was kind of, and I've been told that he's still, at least, you know, relative to Provo, still pretty popular in Papua, but at the same time, you still have a lot of crackdowns on the Papua independence movement, and you also have a good amount of discrimination against ethnic Papuans in other parts of Indonesia. So I was wondering if you could speak to that at all. Uh, Papua is probably Indonesia's richest, naturally richest uh, area. Uh, it has been restricted for foreign journalists, UN observers, rights monitors to visit over the last 50 years. It is also having an indigenous community which is marginalized economically, socially, culturally, politically under Indonesian rule. Uh, human rights abuses are widespread, are consistent over the last 50 years in terms of freedom of expression, freedom of the press, uh, rights for women's rights, child protection, or whatever. Uh, everything is there in Papua. What Human Rights Watch has been doing over the last decade is uh, only two things. One is freedom of expression. We have been campaigning for the government to release political prisoner in Papua. Many activists, Papuan, Papuan activists, they raised the Morning Star flag to protest against whatever the government had abused them. And because of that, they are sent to prison long, long term. Uh, 10 years, sometimes 20 years. In, in that sense, we are quite successful. Over the last 10 years, there are less and less political prisoners. In the past, once you raise the Morning Star, boom, go to the prison, five years, seven years. Now, detain, maybe one night, mostly one night, but sometimes three nights. Although we protested the government because there are right now three new political prisoners, those 
uh, activists who organized online petition asking the UN to grant them uh, a UN sponsor a UN sponsored referendum in West Papua. The other thing that we are doing is asking, pressing the government to lift the restrictions against foreign journalists going to Papua. And again, it's been going on for 50 years. Uh, I talked with candidate Jokowi himself uh, in 2014, asking him, he asked me, what shall I do uh, on Papua? And I said, release political prisoner, and then lifting the restriction for foreign journalists to do that. And he did that uh, once he came, uh, went to power. Uh, he said openly in May 2015 that foreign journalists are now free going to Papua. Like, you know, when you go to Bali, you go to Medan, Surabaya, Pontiana, it's free. No need to ask for permission. But then the deep state military civilian persisted against President Jokowi to the extent that more and more uh, foreign journalists, BBC, uh, Jap Japan, Japanese, and RTTV in Europe they were arrested, despite having still requiring the so-called travel permit to go to Papua. So it's, it showed that it is very hard to, not only to lobby the government, we have to lobby uh, 18, 18 ministerial uh, representative in charge of Papua. The, the underlying issue in Papua is racism, simply racism against black skin, dark skin, curly hair people uh, in Papua. So in the past, we are keep on talking about white man racism against dark skin people. I think we should talk about brown skin people, uh, <laughs> racism against the darker skin uh, 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 group like the Papuans. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, so my name is Maria. I'm a student at NYU Wagner and I have a question for Mr. Carlos. Um, uh, I have a question in particular because we didn't talk about it that much in regards to free speech, is the role of populism and like public opinion in the Philippines in regards to like these human rights abuses because what I'm hearing from my Filipino colleagues is that if you're opposing the current administration, you're kind of like in support of this so-called yellow journalism. I think I know you know what I'm talking about, which is like you're supporting like, you know, uh, uh, the Aquino administration, like there's a faction between Aquino and the Marcos. So it's like in, in matters of like human rights abuses, I think uh, the role of public opin opinion is very important and in free speech as well, like in preventing those types of abuses. And uh, I don't know the status of like how people, particularly Filipino people, are supporting the current administration right now. What do you say about that? But just on that, the support, uh, he's still very popular. He's still very, uh, well, Filipino in general. I mean, popularity has gone down a little bit, just, but just a little bit. He's still way up there. He's, uh, a lot of Filipinos still love him, apparently. Um, at the start of, the ele of, of his uh, administration, the, the support was even across the board. But uh, two years into it, more middle class, upper class people supported him, and then the poorer, the poorer ones, the, the support sort of dropped a little bit. But it's still there, very large. Uh, so yeah, and they're, they're using that as political capital to do pretty much whatever they want. Now, as to populism and your specific example about how the media, the yellow journalism, yellow media thing, that's sort of the, the kind of the narrative and the issue that the government actually, you know, used from the very beginning to try to depict, to try to, 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 to depict any criticism of this government as a yellow, as coming from the yellows of the previous administration, which is absolutely uh, uh, baseless. To them, every every critic of Duterte must be working for the Yellows for the previous administration, which is, you know, of course not true. But it has somehow stuck. It has somehow it colors the discussion. If you go if you go online and say something about the government against the government, you're immediately bashed as being oh because you're a yellow tar, you're you're working for the Kinos and all of that, and which is an unfortunate uh, unfortunate. Uh, development in my country but um, you know and, and, and the, the populism really of the 30 springs from I mean truth be told springs from the fact that a lot of the issues that came up before him were uh, the result of 
uh, misgovernance by the previous administrations, and not just the Aquino administrations, but the previous ones. I mean, this is this this whole problem that Duterte misused for his own political uh, uh, benefit was created way, way before Aquino. And this started all the way back. You can trace all of this back to the Marcos dictatorship, in fact. A lot of, uh, it's funny because I was just message uh, before I came, I flew her here uh, the other day by one reporter who asked me about an article I wrote. When did Corey die? Um, yeah. I, I the election, so. 2014, probably. So asked me about an op-ed I wrote, which basically said that uh, uh, Cory Aquino can be blamed for some of the problems of this country. Because uh, for one, she didn't, uh, she didn't, uh, what do you call this? Uh, she continued paying the debts of this, of the Marcus debts after the, uh, the the election, she did not. Oh, there's a word for that uh, when you you sort of repudiate the debt. Oh yeah, debt repudiation. <laughs> debt repudiation, they, they, they which many them. many nationalists and progressives were calling for. Uh, she did not do that. That she was still, uh, you know, uh, 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 she still belonged to the same political ruling class after the revolution. Uh, and, and and I was asked by this guy, uh, do I still believe that to be the case, or was just was that just a knee jerk reaction? Uh, because of her death, uh, in hindsight, do you still cling to that notion? I said, well, nothing has changed, basically. I mean, it's, it's, this is not, you know, this is my view about Cory Aquino hasn't changed. My, in fact, all of the 30 now merely, merely reinforced my view of her and the previous governments from the very start. So, I mean, the point being that this problem that the 30 is now misusing has, you know, is a result of so many years and years of misgovernment in the Philippines. And the, the thing with Duterte is so clever and so, you know, in, 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 in exploiting all of this and turning this into something, you know, you call it whatever you want, populism or what. To me, it's just crude political, uh, 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 you know, uh, talent that he has. <laughs> uh, but, uh, yeah, and I often tell people, and I probably mentioned this to you, David, in one of my interviews, if he hadn't existed, you would have invented him because we have so much problem in the Philippines. And it's beyond him. It's just, you know, it's, uh, uh, unfortunately, it's just beyond him. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Noor, and uh, is, my question is um, in relation to populism. Yeah. Is Duterte's uh, move or call to change Philippines' name to Maharadika a populist move? You know what? Uh, what do you think? There are a lot of things that people should. <laughs> should really uh, just ignore whatever he says. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of the things that comes out of his mouth are designed to distract all of us. Uh -huh. You know, and one of them, Maharnika is one of them. Maharnika is, is an old concept that Marcos used before. This is a name, original name, that Marcos wanted for the Philippines. And nobody even knows what it means. I mean, some Indian guy said, it's, a, it's, it's not pleasant to call yourself country Maharnika because it's... Uh, it's uh, some Sanskrit, Sanskrit word for Sanskrit yeah, word for Sanskrit uh, like genitals or something. I don't know. <laughs> I'm not sure. I just read it somewhere. But it's, the thing, <laughs> the thing is, that they're, they're conjuring all of these things to try to rattle people, distract them from from all the pressing issues that the country is facing. And is that a pop? The question is, is that a popular move? Well, it's not. But he has a way of making it popular. That's a, that's a more dangerous thing, I think. Any other questions? Yeah. Um, thank you. Hi, my name is Iwa. I'm second year here studying at Simba Columbia University. I have a question for you, Mr. Andreas, regarding the National Commission on Child Protection. When you mentioned that, I mean, in basically it's an independent, it's supposed to be independent commission, right? Although you mentioned a number of political, affiliated people or officials in this commission. And then you mentioned about um, the regulation or something like that that criminalized LGBT. My question is, what made this um, regulation or plan, I don't know whether it's already in pass or not, uh, there from the first place? Is it because of the pressure from, I don't know, religious driven organization in the country in order so that this national commission have this kind of view or regulation towards the LGBT community or 
uh, is it um, an issue of momentum or time? Because political party, and then we have election and whatnot. How do you see this influence coming through the National Commission? In, in general, their view is that gay men are the ones that usually abuse children. Their view is that the abused children will later become gay men themselves. It is wrong, of course. Uh, this view is also popular among many, many Muslim circles all over Indonesia. Uh, three years ago, there was an Islamist group called Aliyah. Uh, it basically, in Bahasa Indonesia, stands for Loving Family Alliance that filed a petition at the Constitutional Court. They argue, they are mostly professors, they are mostly academics from Bogor, from Bandung, from Jakarta, many with PhDs, many study in the West. And they argue that Indonesia Criminal Court has some loopholes. The Dutch inherited Criminal Court only criminalize consensual sex outside of marriage if if the spouses or the children file a lawsuit against I guess the fathers in, in, in most cases and they said the criminal code does not criminalize in Arabic called uh, uh, what is it what is the term in Arabic Consensual sex. Zina. So they say Indonesia Criminal Code does not criminalize Zina, the consensual sex outside of marriage. The, the Child Protection Commission supported that petition and they warned the court to criminalize two types of sexual relationship. One is hetero consensual sex outside of marriage, including including among singles. And the second, of course, uh, gay sex. It was spearheaded by the chairman of the Child Protection Commission. There, his statement was bizarre. And to make the political context of, for instance, that in the, in the future, Doctors can transplant penis, including at the forehead of a man, for whatever. So something really bizarre that they it's made. Really sad. Oh yeah. You <laughs> <laughs> laugh now, but wait. <laughs> Suddenly, I'm so happy for my president. <laughs> <laughs> he made that kind of statement. It's on on their website, on their video. You can you can read their testimony. I was there listening to him. The political context of this man is that he was a personal assistant to the chairman of the Indonesian Ulama Council. The chairman, the council chairman name is Makruf Amin. He is now running as the vice presidential candidate to President Jokowi. So again, and these are all influential figures, uh, they are all over uh, strategic position in Indonesia. Fortunately, that petition was rejected by the court. The court correctly argued that we have no power to write a new law. You have to go to the parliament. And thus, they pressure the parliament to change the, the criminal code uh, because of pressure from the UN, from the European Union, from the US under Obama, uh, it was not passed last year. But they are still trying. Just very quickly, Chief, before you continue this question. I apologize to the lady. I did not want to sound dismissive of your question <laughs> about the populism of the 30. 
but I, I, I may have sounded dismissive. I, I didn't mean to. <laughs> no, <laughs> Sorry. <that's laughs> so we are running out of time. I actually had a question uh, in this rather dire landscape that you all have painted <laughs> because of things on the ground in the countries you've described, but also because of the international um, lackluster regimen that cares about human rights. It's very difficult. And you mentioned building new coalitions, Phil. Could you talk a little bit about that? And if anybody else wants to add, what do you do when there, you don't have very many friends anymore? <laughs> well, I mean, I mean, you know, never has Finland and Norway been so important. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, I mean, basically it means you don't leave any stone unturned. I mean, so. You know, we don't just sort of go for the bigs, saying, you know, we're going to get the the uh, U.S. and, and the U.K. and and uh, the E.U. delegation. But you know, we we start going out and asking others to do certain things. You know, uh, you know, the Swedish ambassador in Thailand, uh, Stefan Harsberg, has been great. Um, he sort of is a very senior diplomat, but he's also someone who convenes a group of like-minded diplomats working on on care about human rights issues. You know, so, you know, we take cases to him, you know, and they basically divvy it up. Like, okay, who's going to do this case, who's going to work on this case, and things like that. So, you know, you have to work with sort of the people you have on the ground to make things happen. Um, you know, we, you know, we work on, you know, trying to get UN agencies to do more. Uh, you know, I mean, and sometimes that, sometimes that's, that's involved. I mean, we've got, people, we've got various cases I'm working on, I uh, can't really talk about right now, but, you know, where you know the Canadians are playing a role, where uh, UNHCR is playing a role, where you know we've got another couple embassies involved. I mean, it's it's just being much more innovative and being willing to make the extra phone calls and make the extra. It's more work for us, basically. But you know, it's something that has to be done because we can't just go, you know, to down the wireless road in Bangkok and you know ask the Americans to carry the water. They're not going to do it. You know. They will do uncertain things, but you know, even if you convince the sort of acting ambassador now, the Chargé d'Affaires, to do something, the Times re realize that he doesn't necessarily have backup in Washington. That you know, he's not getting instructions from Washington. They're not getting demarched on human rights issues because Washington said go in there. They're doing it. They're doing it on their own. And um, in some cases, you know, uh, there's some very good diplomats who. I remember talking with Glenn Davies from, from the, the former U.S. ambassador to Thailand who just left a couple months ago. You know, and he had this huge uh, event, uh, LGBT rights, uh, you know, basically took the historic mansion of, of uh, you know, of, that he lives in and lived in in Bangkok and, you know, got the rainbow colors on it and it was a huge night out for everybody. Everybody felt really good about it. And it was important because it was a morale booster for the LGBT community. And I said, so, you know, what, is, what does Washington think about this? He said, well, I had the budget, and I just did it. <laughs> <laughs> so anybody else want to chime in? We are over time, but if anybody has any last words on building coalitions? I'll just add very briefly from there. Um, I do think it's always worth talking to everyone, because people can really surprise you, as you've said, and there isn't always a consistent message within one organization or one country's representation. Um, when we were in Myanmar in 2015 talking about this, um, most people were, the Rohingya, most people were vastly uninterested, and uh, it wasn't on the UN resident coordinators. Uh, radar at all, at least in terms of something that they were interested in taking action on. But there were other UN agencies that were very interested and other people who, you know, might not have been in a position of power at that time, but will have long careers and will do things later who were interested in hearing things. So um, yeah, I think it was important not to assume things and to talk to everyone that you could talk to. Well, you have to also, you have to, you have to, sometimes things work out. For So, for instance, on the, the Rohingya issue, one of the reasons there's such a strong support within the UN General Assembly and the UN Human Rights Council is that the uh, OIC has finally come in in a very significant way uh, to support the European Union and work with the European Union on passage of, of resolutions and pushing the Rohingya issue forward. 
And there was a problem within the OIC where some countries were holding it up, including Iran. And, you know, we, of course, fight with Iran all the time on Syria and other things like that. Uh, but uh, Ken Roth uh, raised the issue of the Rohingya with the foreign minister, and the foreign minister was like, what? We're, we have that position? No, 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 we can't have that. Mm -hmm. And he basically changed the position of Iran on supporting uh, accountability for the Burmese military again because of what they did to the Rohingya. You know, so you can, you never know. On that note, I'd like to thank you all very, very much for a, a actually wonderful session. Thank you.